don't put things on LinkedIn or on social media that you want people to see. Don't give them what you want them to, to know. Don't show up to teach. Every single person is on there to make money, that's it. So you find out who your audience is and how they're making money on there and just give them that. Hey folks, Garrett here. In this episode of the Most Awesome Founder Podcast, we introduce Corey Warfield, entrepreneur, advisor, connector, and LinkedIn influencer with over 250,000 followers. Corey and I met almost five years ago while mentoring his startup Shedwool in a small accelerator program in Colorado. Little did I know then what life would have in store for Corey. Growing a startup to 20 plus employees, building a massive LinkedIn follower base, and launching numerous new ventures off his massive professional network. In this episode, we'll be discussing Corey's incredible founder journey from literally the bottom to the top, how faith and humility drive success, and some really useful tips and tricks for leveraging LinkedIn to grow both your personal brand and your business. Hope you find Corey's story as inspiring and, and as informative as I did. This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Coming to you from WHU, <laughs> on the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Corey Warfield, great to have you on the most awesome founder podcast. And after so many years, great to see you again, mate. Great to see you as well. And great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am really looking forward to our discussion. You know, I think you have a really interesting story to tell and a unique journey um, that kind of brought you to your entrepreneurial success and have taken you on a circuitous path through life that um, I think our audience will be fascinated to, to hear about. So even though you're on the other side of the world, close to my home, my old home, not so close to my current home, I think there's a a lot of lessons that you can share that will be invaluable and, and interesting. So once again, thanks for, thanks for joining. Absolutely. Cool. So I kind of start all of our podcasts asking our guests the same question, and it kind of gives you a chance to um, put a little context behind what we're going to talk about. So, you know, storytelling is, is such a powerful tool for learning. So I'd like to know, maybe you could kind of tell us, where you come from, and kind of the journey that brought you to where you are today. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm from a little suburb just north of Chicago called Evanston. And growing up in Evanston in the 90s, I was an honors and AP student. I got a scholarship to college. I went to college in Indiana for a year, realized very quickly that I hated it. Um, that college was not for me. I didn't learn anything. It was a, it was a gross misappropriation of, of my time. And I, I don't advocate that for anyone else. Uh, with who, for whom it doesn't resonate, and I'm certainly not telling any any parents uh, that that their kids are, are wasting their dollars or their time. But for me, I, I realized it wasn't for myself. And and at 19, I was um, only self actualized enough to know that I wanted a year off for sure. So I took the year off, and I got a job as a metrologist at Searle Pharmaceutical Research, which was fantastic. At 19, making the equivalent of like 70 grand a year, uh, and then I started. Uh, from there, doing some software testing for Rand McNally. So I worked on the first 3D Atlas and GPS software back in 97. Um, making the same money, I felt great. Uh, realized I didn't need to go to college. I had friends a few years older than me graduating college, hoping to make half of what I was making and having a hard time finding jobs. And so that I rode out for just a couple of years, really enjoyed that. Uh, but then I had some life, life experiences happen that just threw me for a real loop. And I found myself uh, on, on a coast of the country that I, I knew no one in um, without a dollar to my name because I'd, I'd been robbed for the, the bit of money I'd brought out. And so I ended up being homeless for about a year and a half. So I was a guy, right, sleeping under bridges, sleeping in parks, asking pe people for money on the street, going days without eating, no ID, 
Um, and it was, it never inherently felt like it was a forever thing, thank God. Um, but it was definitely, you know, the bottom of the barrel, right? And, and at a certain point, I just decided that that wasn't the life that I wanted. It wasn't the life for me. And so I started washing dishes at a little restaurant in a, in a sleepy uh, town in Colorado. I'd been brought to a little ski town in the middle of nowhere called Telluride. And so I was living in a garage with another guy. This is, I think, 2001, uh, maybe 2002. And I, I started washing dishes and I was the best employee they ever had for a couple of reasons. I couldn't afford to ski or snowboard. So everyone else was taking every powder day off, right? And I, I was showing up. I also didn't have any electricity or any running water or a bathroom in the garage I was living in. So I would show up just to kind of splash some water on my face and, and use the bathroom, right? And, and they fed us and they, they gave us these employee meals. And so I was the best dishwasher they ever had, became the best busboy they ever had. A regular in that town named Peter Yarrow uh, requested me to be his waiter because uh, he loved the job I did as a busboy. And one day the the ski bum who was supposed to be waiting on him was taking too long. And I ran over as the bus boy and I did a great job. So I, he ended up asking for me to be his waiter. And so I was the bus boy that was allowed to wait on only this guy when he came in. And it turned out his, he's uh, had written a song called Puff the Magic Dragon. He was part of Peter, Paul and Mary. I mean, back in the sixties. Right. But so it turns out he was kind of a big deal in town. And because he loved me, I did such a good job. The next season they asked if I'd be a, a waiter at that concept. So I started waiting tables, did a good job, uh, found opportunities at some of the nicer and nicer places in town. So I worked my way down the street to the oldest, nicest, most expensive steakhouse in that small town, became their head server, got certified as a sommelier, started bartending. And so that started a couple of year journey for me uh, that culminated in being a restaurant executive of a national concept. And so I did that for some years and, uh, you know, I was wearing a suit and tie to work every day. I was making decent money. It's not what I was making at the steakhouse in the Telluride, however. And one year, year end, I was doing, doing some, uh, some budgeting. And I realized that the, the bartenders at our high end concept nationally were making more than I was. And I remembered how much fun I'd had bartending and, 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 I, you know, frankly, I, the money, the money was intriguing. So I went back into that side of things for about a decade. I, I went back to, uh, bartending at a prime steakhouse here in Chicago where I'd ended back at, at because I had some family that was sick and dying and all that. And I wanted to come back and just spend time with those that, um, that I, you know, that I had in my life, even though I'd kind of abandoned them years prior when I went on, on my, my soul, my soul uh, contract and, and, and finding myself, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. So I did that for some years and uh, about Five years ago, I realized the scheduling in the restaurant industry was so terrible. I lived that price point or that pain point as a manager, as an executive, as, as a worker. And so I started my first software company called Shedwell. And at this point, you know, we've got some of the big national companies using that software. I've raised about $3 million for that venture, although it was long and hard and it took me years to do that. Um, but we've got, I think my head counts at 25 full-time employees there and I serve as the chief visionary officer. So in uh, in short in short order, that's kind of the journey that took me from my hometown to the streets and then rising my way up to an industry that I ended up solving a major problem for. Now, flash forward these few years since then, I'm quite certain that I have undiagnosed ADHD and I can't help but um, keep starting more companies, both for myself and helping others do the same. So I, and I've now started two more companies that are doing a lot of fun things. One of them is gamifying LinkedIn. Uh, I've started a, a podcast. I, I've started a six figure coaching and consulting agency as well. And, and I've helped over a hundred founders launch their own companies through uh, primarily founder Institute and my own network. So it's been a fun journey. I, I didn't finish college. I don't have an MBA. Um, you know, I, I, I learned some of, some of what you're taught to know um, in the startup world through an accelerator and post accelerator program. Um, that was probably somewhat formative, although it wasn't a, a net positive experience for me. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, it's, we can go down any of those rabbit holes, but effectively <laughs> that's, that's what brought me to being a tech founder. And, uh, you know, now, now I do some small angel investments and I just got into crypto and um, it's fun. I'm having a blast. Awesome. Wow. You know, I, I mean, a lot of your story hits home for me. I think we have uh, so, some similar trajectories of, 
of highs and lows and all of it being fed by our ADHD along the way. So a lot of that really resonates and it's an incredible story, Corey. And, you know, I'm listening to it going, there's so many parts I want to, I want to dig into. Um, but maybe I would like to ask you first, like, you know, you and I both kind of experienced like kind of having to pick yourself up with pretty much nothing and, and build yourself up and kind of create a path. Like, did that, did that experience where you were kind of near the bottom, do you think that that was a catalyst for um, your hustle, your entrepreneurial hustle that you kind of defines who you are today? Only to a degree, but, but I'll, I'll put a caveat. I think what that did for me, because when you're living on the streets, you end up in and out of jail. And so I was in and out of jail quite a bit. And that's where I found my spiritual awakening. And that's where I came to, you know, acknowledge and accept that there is a divine presence of creation. And, you know, that's what a lot of people call God. And that's where I started my, you know, spiritual and and religious journey. And that I will ascribe and and credit all of my successes, all of, all of my, you know, persona, all of my beingness too. Um, That really is what I, I live my life around it. And my, my favorite song, and it's actually been my walkout song to, to someone like my big demo days and all that, but is Ziggy Marley's Love is My Religion. That really resonates with me. So I've read all the books from the Quran to the Book of Mormon and the Bible many times. And But I don't care what people call a prophet. I don't care if people follow a certain uh, you know creed. Um, I just, I love God. I love people that love God and people that don't, doesn't, it doesn't bother me either. That's their own journey. So it's it's a lot different, I think, than, you know, some of the founders that might necessarily, you know, give all the glory to God or anything like that. But, but I know that I wouldn't be who I am or where I was without my own personal, you know, relationship with the divine and the universe and, and whatever we want to call it. So I think, you know, from that perspective, absolutely formative. Other than that, I, I think, you know, I aspire to be humble. And I think I was probably a lot less humble before I found myself having to ask people for spare change to eat a slice of pizza. So um, you know, in those two capacities, I'd say it probably was a catalyst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really profound, man. Um, I want to. I'd like to kind of pick up the story where you and I met, which I guess now has been four or five years ago, um, and we met in that same town of Telluride, Colorado, and you were just starting your uh, schedule. Your restaurant scheduling app and going through a small accelerator program then. And um, in my understanding, it was kind of a a long and grinding journey to get that, get that business really going. Can you share a little bit of how you uh, managed to kickstart that business and make it what it is today? Absolutely. And yeah, although people can connect some dots, I'll ask that we not name that accelerator, but interestingly, um, the, the restaurant that I washed dishes in that I waited on Peter Yarrow in that really is what got me out of a garage and into a beautiful house with a pool table and kegerator and all of that. Um, the accelerator that I was in that you and I met while I was part of is now in that restaurant. So the restaurant closed down. It's now the office of that accelerator. But you know, they brought in prolific people that have built and sold billion dollar companies. And unfortunately, I experienced a lot of mentor whiplash there. So you know, every, every mentor that was willing to talk to me, which wasn't nearly all of them, um, but had completely 180 degree vehemently opposing ideas of what I should be doing, how I should be doing it. So it was impossible to satiate any of them. Half of them were saying that they would invest if I just did this and that. So trying to raise money, you start to try to appease those, all of them, once I did everything to the letter, you know, it turned out they probably didn't have any money in the bank and, or weren't really writing checks, um, which is fine. I don't think anyone in my cohort received a dollar of investment, although the, the, the accelerator raised a $10 million fund while we were there. And it's just very bizarre. Um, I think most of them are no longer in business. And um, again, it is what it is. I wish everyone success. But I think through that process, a lot of it was really rudimentary. And a lot of it was, you know, all right, how, how are we going to get some revenue in the door? And for us, it's it was me and a co-founder and, and an idea. It's like, well, the way we're going to get revenue in the door is to build product. And the way to do that is to raise money, right? I was following that whole paradigm. And now is, you know, I ended up having to bootstrap the product to, to market and to profitability. And it, it wasn't until I had paying customers coast to coast that I was able to raise our first half million dollars and build out a team and things like that. Um, 
but what I did learn is that you don't need to raise money. And, and so now, you know, I haven't raised money for, for two of my ventures. And uh, most of the companies that I've helped others launch don't raise money until, you know, frankly, they don't need it anymore. And um, in the last few months, I've helped raise about $10 million for some of the projects I'm involved in. So um, I, I still play that game. Uh, but I, I, I find that people don't want to invest in you until you don't need it anymore. So I try to help people get to where they don't need it. And then if they want to take it for PR or you know, to finally pay themselves or whatever it is. And, you know, at that point you become very investable. So. Right. Right. You know, I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper on kind of part of that process, because although we haven't uh, talked that many times over the past few years, um, obviously um, social media and whatnot keeps, keeps people connected even across far distances. And obviously one of the things that became quite evident to me was seeing your, your profile grow on LinkedIn. Um, can you kind can you share a little bit about, you know, what you did there, why you did it and, you know, how that kind of helped spurn your whole entrepreneurial career, if not one or two businesses? Absolutely. And it's, I, I will, I will absolutely give LinkedIn all the credit in the world. I wouldn't be Corey Warfield other than on paper. And I wouldn't have had any companies anyone had heard of, let alone that's, you know, disrupting certain industries had it not been for, for LinkedIn. So what happened for me, I got active there about three years ago. And uh, there was a lady that, that seemed to be my prospect, right? She, she helped run some big restaurant groups. She owned some restaurants and, uh, it, it, LinkedIn had just allowed people to start sharing videos and she was doing videos of herself talking and the videos went kind of crazy. She had like 20 or 30,000 people that followed her and her, her videos were getting like a hundred likes every time they posted. And she's a pretty blonde lady. So that might've helped, but I just really, I liked the traction, and the visibility and so many of the people engaging with her restaurant executives. So I, I realized if I could get on her radar, she could be a customer. She could potentially be an investor. She could potentially make some intros. So I reached out to her and I pitched her and she said, whoa, 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 that's not how this works. Um, don't pitch anybody on LinkedIn um, for some weird reason. I like you, but not if you ever pitch me again. So don't do that. Uh, but but feel free to kind of let me know what you're doing and I'll, I'll just give you some feedback. So so I did. And she said, all right, well, it sounds like you're still fairly early, but it sounds like you need to start building some relationships. I would recommend that you start to get active on LinkedIn and do what I do with these short little videos. I think she even called them like these, these dumb little videos. I'm thinking like, but you have 20 something thousand followers and a hundred likes. Like they're not dumb. They're not little. And, um, but so I started doing them as well. And I think I just didn't, I didn't know better than to stop when, when for a month in they were getting like no views and no likes. And I just kept making them. And, uh, I think it was the second month that I was making these videos, just really still trying to get on her radar, her, her people's radars, but, and, and just taking what she had said to heart, um, my videos started to take off a bit. And so I, I started typing some posts that weren't videos as well to switch it up. And then they started doing better. And that's when I realized there's computer science behind this algorithm. When I do certain things, it'll get me more views. When I do certain things, it, it resonates more with a wider audience. Wow. If I do this, I'm getting second and third connections to lean in. And then if I use the right target, you know, the, the right hashtags, I can target this to, to some actual prospects and to some actual investors and some actual, you know, collaborators and partners. So I doubled down on that. I started posting every day, started studying the algorithm, A-B testing what, what did and didn't work. And for some reason, it just clicked. And so within a few months, I was getting hundreds of people following my profile every week. The followers are starting to grow. My posts are starting to do better. And then I, I got on the radar of a guy. He was the CTO of the Daily Mail, um, which is a big deal. And he had hundreds of thousands of followers and was on, on a fast track to a million followers. And he, he put up a post about me. And he basically said, I have friends that are known globally that have millions of followers and their posts don't get nearly the engagement of this guy with 6,000 followers or however many I had. He's like, you need to know Corey Warfield. Well, after that post, I had tens of thousands of people following my uh, profile, visiting my profile, people started tagging me like crazy. And my next post has got hundreds of, of likes on them a piece. And so I, I am an opportunist and I realized that the time was then. So I struck while the iron was hot, used all the, all the kind of uh, 
frameworks and, and the little tips and tricks I learned by testing the algorithm. And so at this point, I now just keep growing daily. I get you know somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand people now that follow my profile every single day. And I've gotten over 10 million views on my content there. I've had posts get, you know, three, 4 million views. Those big posts all have, have turned in, into pilots with national brands. So, so it's really effective. And it's the money that I've raised for my companies and, and for the founders that I work with primarily comes from people that have seen what I do on LinkedIn and most of my big prospects, most of my big clients, most of my big pilots. Um, and then it, it ended up kind of organically birthing a coaching and consulting uh which now is an agency um, that's doing big things. I've got, I've got some partners and some employees and um, you know, it's always going to create jobs, but the results that we're getting for our clients are so amazing as well that it literally like some days I just sit back and I'm just so grateful to be part of something bigger than myself. And I, I attribute LinkedIn to all of that. So I think some of it is just diligently paying attention to computer science and algorithms. Some, you know, some of it is just striking while the iron is hot. Uh, lastly, I would say, I think it's still a very under leveraged platform, especially when people start to use it in tandem with platforms like Clubhouse or like TikTok and things like that. So it's, it's been a hugely powerful and, and, and hum, a humblingly powerful platform for me and, and for many that I see as well. Awesome. So if I understand correctly, you decided to take, use LinkedIn as a channel to help grow Shedwell and grow your business and you went in organically and grew it that way and you know obviously understanding the algorithm is important but you also i mean at least in my rudimentary knowledge of this you also have to have compelling content how did you define you know can you talk a little bit about the type of content you created and how it evolved over time i know you started with videos but what were you talking about and how how as you ab tested it did you uh, get better at it and find things that resonated with such a big audience. Sure. Well, I think I'll take one step back to answer that. And the other reason I got so active in addition to the influencer, was I read a book by Gabriel Weinberg called Traction. And it's a fantastic book. And I always say it's by Gabriel Weinberg because there are two books called Traction. And they're both good. But the one I love is by Gabriel Weinberg, the, the, the founder of DuckDuckGo. And uh, it basically said there are only 12 ways to scale a company and to get traction. Here they are. They will not work in the same industry for the same companies. It's very individualized. And if you don't try all 12 of them, you won't know it'll work. If you try them all, it'll be obvious which one will work. And then you dig into them. We'll, we'll tell you how to dig into any of the 12. And so they're, you know, they're going through guerrilla marketing and, and paid marketing and, and influencer marketing. And, you know, social media kept coming up. And so I tried a few channels. Nobody cared about what I was doing on, on Facebook. You know, Twitter, these years later, still doesn't know I exist. Although I get people like Mark Cuban retweeting me and things like that. But my retweets will get zero likes. So it's, it's bizarre how Twitter just doesn't, Twitter doesn't like me. And that's fine. Um, it's, it's, it's fine. There's, there's, there's enough other platforms out there. Um, but, but I realized by reading this book, I tried every channel. I realized social media was, was my go-to tried some platforms, LinkedIn evolved and emerged as like clearly the one that, that I could resonate with. And I think it was a blue water, red water um, type scenario where there weren't a lot of people from the restaurant industry. There weren't a lot of early stage founders that had no clue what they were doing that were willing to be authentic and vulnerable enough to give people a front row seat to that. So I think people just like to see me evolve to kind of now tie it into the, the content question. But the other thing that I did... I made the mistake with, with that influencer and I never made it again of trying to hard pitch. So I've never pitched. I'll tell people what I do, what I'm all about. I'll, I'll let people know how they can potentially work with me. I'm um, very subtly, but other than that, it's just, a, I'm Corey. Here, here's, here's what my days look like. Here's how I hire. Here's, here, here's what makes me, you know, sad. Here's, here's, here's what makes me happy. You know, um, bamboo straws instead of plastic straws, uh, diversity and inclusion, empathy, right? Like just talking about these things that, won't resonate with everybody, but the people with whom it resonates with, they get really adamantly um, excited and people have opinions about it. So I think just really leaning into my audience. Um, the other thing that I'd say has, has been powerful for me, I often say perfection is the enemy of progress, but just not overthinking anything. People are like, well, how much time do you spend on LinkedIn? Like some days I, and I don't need more, but at the time, like some days I spend 10 hours on LinkedIn, literally. There are days I spend 10 minutes on LinkedIn 
like um, most of my best posts have taken me less than 10 minutes to craft from from ideation to hitting the word post like I just don't overthink it I don't have a content calendar I've had some BAs before I, I have to let them go within weeks at a time because it can impact my my brand perception and so just just doing it all myself being authentic being vulnerable I think has been really the 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 driving force I mean then just being really supportive of others so I, I love to do everything I can I also treat everyone on that platform like they're they're a long lost best friend of mine so when people see me engaging with the you know the Tim Drapers or the you know some of the big names in this world um you know the Kevin Harrington's like they now have become friends of mine but they weren't when I started treating them like friends years ago. It was just, you know, Hey Tim, whatever it is, I love your stuff. And um, you know, people look at that like, wow, Corey knows, knows, knows Tim Draper. Well, now I do. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but sometimes it's just going for what you want and being very intentional. Right. Right. You know, it's, I remember seeing one of your posts on LinkedIn, maybe it was a year or two ago. Um, and correct me if I, I may be describing it wrong, but I think you were like in your garden and you and your girlfriend had just like planted veggies or something. And I remember thinking, I could see this, something like that being really controversial or be perceived as being really authentic, right? Because I think there's almost like, there's a couple schools of thought on a channel like LinkedIn, right? One is keep it professional. I'm here for the, you know, the business stuff. And then the other one is like, I'm going to present my authentic self and just build a, a community and a brand around it. The reason I'm asking this is, you know, different parts of the world have different types of business cultures, you know, and Germany's different from the U.S. You know, we in the U.S., we tend to be on a very first name basis. Things are really quite casual. You know, you, it's very kind of like relationship oriented. Um, in Germany, I would say, it's, of course, it's not exclusively like this, but it's more so this is my work life. This is my personal life. And I keep those things separate and almost kind of two separate identities. So I think a lot of people here wouldn't post about their personal life in a, on a bit through a business channel like that. Did you, is that something you thought about? Is that something you planned? Did you have any reactions or from other people? Or did you just say, hey, I'm just going to I'm just going to share my life experience and see what happens. Yeah. So I, I ended up doing probably 50 posts from the garden. And I was one of the first, I think 20 people in the world to have access to LinkedIn live. So I used to go live from the garden, but I'd always tie in business analogies. So it's right. When you're growing a business, it's like growing a tomato or, you know, when, when you're, when you're thinking about picking a candidate, it's like picking these peppers or whatever, just making these little correlations. And again, never overthought them. It was in real time. So I look at this sunflower. It's, you know, when you guys saw it a week ago, it didn't have any petals. And now it's got a hundred of them. It's kind of like, right. Like you, we didn't see all these petals that were inside the stock or right? just making these little correlations. Um, but other than that, my entire approach is, is it, it, it's very, it's very aligned to like the, the marketing qualified needs or sales qualifying needs that we talk about in entrepreneurship. I don't want to do business with people I don't like. And so the people that don't want to talk about their personal life on a professional platform, I don't want to do business with them. Mm -hmm. I've turned down millions of dollars of, of investment from people that frankly, I wouldn't have wanted to have at my dinner table. People that take themselves too much, uh, too seriously. People that treat me or anyone like they're not as good as them. I don't want to do business with those people. So I'm sure there have been a lot of people over the years that don't like seeing me at a music concert or don't like seeing me in a brewery that might be a client, or don't like seeing me shout out a hundred people that I think are fantastic leaders that, that the world should know. Um, I encourage all of those people to disconnect with me, not to follow me. They can block my account. I don't, they don't matter to me. And it's, you know, God loves them. I wish them enough success as well, but I have no need for any of them in my life. So the people that don't like my approach um, I, you know, I almost become a little flamboyant and over the top because I want to make sure those people don't accidentally follow me. I don't want to pitch from them. I don't want an investment from them. I don't want to hire them. I don't want to collaborate with them. Frankly, I barely even want them as customers. There's, right. And so I think that's, that's a big part of what I've done as well is just really make sure that I land with the people with whom I think I'll land with and resonate with. And, you know, no one on earth is going to be everyone's cup of tea. So I just found a way to make sure that the people that don't like my flavor don't accidentally order me and send it back. Right. I mean, I, I totally agree with that, of course. And, uh, but I want to play devil's advocate a little bit anyways, um, in that, you know, some of us end up in a stage in our career 
where we have the ability to kind of be a little more particular, you know? But um, I do, I can remember the days when I was younger and I was hustling, I didn't have a network, I desperately needed to raise funds where, I, and frankly, I there were experiences where I did raise funds from people that maybe I wouldn't have wanted at my dinner table, you know, because I was making those choices from a point of weakness. And I remember you saying when you were talking about uh, that accelerator program you were in where, you know, these investors were telling you to jump through hoops and you were basically doing it, whatever they said, even though you weren't sure it was the right thing to do and it still didn't get you where you wanted to go. Is, has this kind of approach, is it something you kind of learned along the way when more opportunities were afforded to you? Or did you just have a moment where you were like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build, I'm only gonna surround myself with people that, you know, I would want to break bread with. Yeah, well, I think it happened really early for me before that accelerator. And I, I think it was such a profound learning that I just kind of tripled down on it. But I had a group that wanted to put and I'm going to try to not use any names or, or, or affiliations, although I, I'm very comfortable in who I am and what I stand for. But um, people might connect some dots. But, you know, this is around four years ago, and I, I was starting a company and, and I didn't like some of the things that were happening politically in this country. And uh, I had a group, they liked me from what they knew um, of me and they wanted to invest. They, they, they had a large group uh, of restaurants that could have used this software. They said, it's about time someone built something like this. And so they wanted to put a million dollars into the company pre-launch. And pre-accelerator, and, and that was fantastic, right? To be able to sell a dream, it was basically a back and app and thing. They wanted to put a million dollars in. And so we were going through some of that diligence process. And, and I have every reason to believe they would have given me a million dollars. And that could have changed the trajectory. But I did my first, and I, I think it was actually my last, um, Facebook Live post um, the, the night of a, of a big rally here in Chicago. It was a protest rally. And, you know, there were, lots of people that didn't like what was going on at the time. And, and I was one of them. And so I participated. And at the time I was marching with the people and we were, we were, we were talking about what we believed in. I was getting other people on camera and I had like thousands of people tuned into this live I'm going, that's pretty cool. You know, I think I only had a thousand Facebook friends. It's like all these, you know, people around the world were watching me and the comments were flying and the thumbs up were going all over the screen. And, um, so I felt pretty good about that. And it was, it was peaceful and nobody got hurt. And, and I went home that night and the next morning I had, I had an email from the group and they said, Corey, you know, it brought to our attention that you were out last night and that you did a live stream. And I said, well, yeah, I, I did. Um, they, they said, well, you know, we're glad to have found out, you know, that, that you're, you and we are not aligned and we wouldn't want to do business with you. We don't want to invest in your company and, you know, um, so, so they didn't, and I've never spoken to them since, which is fine as well. But I, I realized in that time, like I dodged a bullet. It was, it was actually the second time in my life someone had handed me a million dollars that I didn't want. The first time I was on a private jet to, to Las Vegas, and it was with some regulars of mine. I was still in the restaurants. I'd come up with a killer proposal for a restaurant. The name isn't that profound. It was called Neighbors Bar and Grill. But was, what was profound is the menu I'd come up with. I had two, two things that I still think would be amazing at a restaurant. The first was my edibles. Everything was in an edible bowl, right? So the French onion soup came in a hollowed out onion. The chili came in a cornbread bowl. There are so many different things. You can eat the bowl. You know, taco salad was, was on there kind of a thing, but like just a lot of edible bowls. The other thing were my gamburgers. And I, after 20 years in the restaurant industry, some of these I knew there was an appetite for. So my gamburgers were game hamburgers. But my hamburger was going to be the only hamburger in the country. And people say, what do you mean by that? Well, it's made out of ham. It was literally ground ham bound together with pineapple juice with a, with a pineapple ring and a half, half of a wheel of baby Swiss on top. It was fantastic on a Hawaiian roll. It was a ham burger. And, and I had a lamb burger, which to me is so much fun to say. It was kind of like a Euro patty, but a lamb burger. And so we, we had this concept and you know, the buffalo burger and the, the turkey burger. And, and I had a veggie burger on there that probably would have, you know, rivaled an impossible burger or something like that today. Um, but so they, they flew me to Las Vegas and gave me a million dollar check um, due to my prospectus. And we were drinking moonshine at whatever the altitude was. And I got real drunk in, in, in this private jet. And I, I told him, I said, wait a minute. What, the one thing I hadn't modeled out was I wasn't going to pay myself as the owner. 
And so I wasn't going to be making money. And then they were friends of mine and uh, I was going to owe my friends a million dollars and not get paid. And, and I knew the failure rate in restaurants and, and in a drunken moment, I told them that I didn't think I wanted to do this. And they kind of laughed and said, well, if you don't want to take a million dollars to start a restaurant, you shouldn't do it. So I said, you're right. And, and I ripped up this check. Right. But so that was a little di- different. That was a, uh, that was a drunken come to Jesus moment. Um, but with these investors at Dodge the Bullet, because we were going to vote differently on a ballot, I was just really glad that I didn't have those people on my cap table, on my board of directors, whatever it might be. Um, so I think ever since then, it made it very a- apparent that I-, I need to make sure I align myself with people that I, we don't need to vote for the same person. I've got, I've got people in every affiliation. I, I voted across the, you know, across the, the board many times in my life. I'm, I'm very principled when it comes to that. And, and I'm also very open-minded, but people that, um, that have diametrically opposing views to myself, um, you know, there, there's not as much, there's not as much opportunity to do big things together. I don't think so. I, I think that really was formative. So, you know, now that you have such a, a big audience, you know, what, Close to three hundred thousand followers, or something like that. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah two fifty, two sixty, yeah. somewhere like that. So, so in having such a big audience, and you have managed to leverage it for fundraising for your business, for starting new ventures, for creating new opportunities, is it is it not difficult to be able to kind of filter through such a large audience to find the people that you really want to work with? How do you how do you find the needle in that massive haystack? I do little things like dropping the, the the peace sign with the and sign and the love sign at the end of some of my posts. And if, if people don't like the peace and love, then, then we probably weren't going to be friends or partners and just little subtle things like that. Um, I've actually gone through as well and found some hashtags and some, some groups that I don't like ideologically and just made sure I wasn't connected to anybody there. And I'm really just very subtle about making sure, but intentional that, that I'm surrounding myself with people that I think are, you know, like-minded or complimentary or, or just that, that I can, that I can get along with personally, because I think if you can't get along with someone personally, you're probably not going to get along with them professionally. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, I mean, you're a guy that's got a pretty open personality. You're charismatic. You're a good communicator. You know, I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that may not feel as comfortable in front of a camera or, you know, being as vulnerable as you've been willing to do. What, I mean, what kind of advice, like, how does somebody kind of get into this game? I think when, and the reason I'm asking is when you think of, of Europe, it is not as, the LinkedIn audience at least is certainly not as evolved, you know, and maybe not as sophisticated as the way people are kind of creating personas and becoming quote unquote influencers in that space. But some people, you know, you see it on YouTube. Some people just have the right personality for that particular platform. Do you think it's something that's learned? Are there tips and tricks? Like what, what would you suggest to somebody that, you know, might be looking at this avenue? Absolutely. So the, the first thing that I would say is that most people that I see on, on LinkedIn or social media that are in the entrepreneur or the leadership space are far too, not only formal, but pushy. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it's almost a demanding expectation that if they put something, people are going to engage with it. And, and that, you know, I don't want to generalize, but for, for a lot of what I see my audience and some of them are friends posting on LinkedIn is almost like they, they expect people to, to read what they have to say, watch what they have to say to, to come. And it's, that's not how this works. And so when I, when I work with my, my personal clients and, and with my, my larger network as well on is, don't put things on LinkedIn or on social media that you want people to see. Don't give them what you want them to, to know. Don't show up to teach. It's a very unique person that goes onto a platform like LinkedIn to learn something, right? And it's once you understand every single person on LinkedIn is there to make money, mm-hmm. period. You're there to get a job. You're there to hire a candidate so that they can make you money. You're a recruiter. You want to place a candidate so you can make your money. You want to sell your course. You want to sell your book. You want to sign some entrepreneurs up so you can get 3% of their companies. Whatever it is, every single person is on there to make money. That's it. So you find out who your audience is and how they're making money on there and just give them that. My, my, my targets typically are high performers that, that have large teams and have raised a lot of money. 
they're there to have fun. That's literally it. They want a 30 second break. They want to laugh. They want to think they don't want to be taught anything. So I see so many, especially European people on LinkedIn saying, Hey, let me tell you something. Hey, guess what I just learned. Hey, let me tell you, nobody cares about any of that. Right. And so rather what, what I do is, Hey, you, you want a quick laugh and you know, and, and that's it. And you can wrap any message you want into that type of content. Once people feel like you're offering them, you know, people talk about value, but what's value? It's not the same to everybody, but um, a laugh. That's what people want. Mm-hmm. A quick thought, a little escape. There are people that just put little videos of beautiful places around the world on there. They get 10,000 likes every time they post it. Why? It's a mental vacation. Mm-hmm. It's brilliant. I don't do it because I think it's, it, it doesn't actually add value beyond just, a, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty. But the way those posts resonate with, with large audiences and amplify is proof positive. So I think it's just a matter of a voice. And one thing I talk to a lot of people about is anyone listening to this right now or watching this can pull out their phone, turn on the video camera, put it on the front camera. So their phone's literally recording them. They hit record and you can talk in your, into your phone while it's recording on video and say something like, this is dumb. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll never put this on LinkedIn. How do people do this? And literally hit stop. It doesn't matter, right? What just psychologically happened is that person just recorded a video for LinkedIn. Don't put it on there. It's crap, right? Nobody wants to see that. That would be a huge ask, but you've ripped the bandage off. You, you've realized how easy it is. And then when people have a thought, they go, wait, maybe I can talk about this. It's not a first time. They, they don't have those butterflies. And it's at the end of the day, I think anyone has a choice to put themselves out there or not. I find that it's very hard to start a company, scale a company, raise money, find companies to invest in, like any of those things without putting yourself out there. So a lot of times I think people just need to get out of their own way, get out of their heads. Right, right. I want to ask a couple kind of quick, like rapid fire questions, because they're of interest to me as I've been trying to kind of navigate and figure out LinkedIn. Um, Articles or posts? Which one do you prefer? Posts. How about um, follow or connect button? Follow. Follow. And uh, paid or organic? So I, I don't... I don't like to be a premium user. I had a fan get me a year of premium. So it's said that I'm premium for about a year now. Um, I don't really use that for anything other than sometimes to see who viewed my profile, but I don't think anyone needs to pay for anything, anything that can be done with sales navigator or recruiter, any of those um, I can do for free on my, on my LinkedIn account. So definitely organic. And then when people follow you, do you, you, do you usually follow back how select, like I'm at this point now where I'm getting, you know, hundreds, I would say over a hundred requests a week and some are connected, which if they're in my community, I'll accept. And if it's a sale, I won't accept it kind of by default, um, like a pitch of some kind, but how do you know, how do you, do you just kind of select based on interest or? Yeah. At this point, I've been at the 30,000 limit of, of connections for some time. So that takes that off my plate. If I see someone highly compelling, I'll, I'll go through and find someone that is completely unrelated to anything I'm doing, or doesn't seem very nice to get rid of, to make room for that person on that basis. Other than that, I go through and I try to follow most of my followers back. I don't care if their profiles in Mandarin or, or, you know, it's some other language I don't speak because Google translates fantastic and any post that's not in a native language has a translate button. So that's not a make it or break it for me. What I'm, what I'm looking for to not follow people back is sub 100 followers. And it's only because I think they're probably a bot. There are bots on LinkedIn and, and I don't engage with bots. Similarly, I, I don't, I don't negotiate with terrorists, right? Other than that, the only thing that'll prevent me from following somebody back, I I don't like the, 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 the Forex. I don't like the crypto, even though I invest in crypto. So I don't follow those accounts. They don't add value to me. Um, and I try not to, and in, 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 I don't try to actively invest my time in people that are um, spreading hatred, division, anything like that. So when I see something in the, in the headline that makes me feel as though they're not there to unify, they're not there to accept other ideologies and perspectives, I won't follow them. Other than that, I go through and I'll follow almost all my followers. I, I probably have like 260 something thousand followers. I'm probably following at least 50, 60, 70,000 of them, maybe a hundred thousand of them. Um, and then I'll follow anybody effectively 
And if I ever see something from someone I'm following that I don't like, then I'll just unfollow them on a, on a case by case basis. So, you know, for me, I'm a big spread and wide net, you know, cast a wide net guy, top of funnel guy. I'll, I'll give everyone a fair shake for the most part. Um, couple hashtags I stray away from. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty equal opportunist uh, when it comes to that. Cool. Cool. Um, with our last few minutes, I want to ask you just a couple quick questions. They, these are ones that I like to ask all of our guests, but um, I think the first one um, really will provide some wisdom from someone that's been on the journey that you have the, the highs and the lows and the, the, all of the experiences in between, but with what you've learned as you've grown older, um, especially in the context of being an entrepreneur, what, what do you wish you could tell your younger self that you know now that would have aided your, your journey? Tongue in cheek, I'd say not to apply to or go to any accelerators, <laughs> but it is what it is. That's all part of my journey. But no, I think bigger, you know, the, the real lesson that I would tell entrepreneurs is to not try to do it all on your own. Um, first of all, anything can be done without raising money. So, so stop trying to raise money until you're ready for it. I think it would be a big one. But the other thing is stop trying. To, you don't need to be the legal and the finance and the marketing. You can find interns, you can find co-founders. And I guess the real distill it is to not try to hold on to too much equity. That's a huge problem I see so many times. And my original co-founder was Shed will ask me a question before he'd get involved and he had grown and, and sold a hundred million dollar company. He'd, he'd been there, done that kind of a thing. And he sat me down and said, Corey, would you rather own a hundred percent of a million dollar company or 1% of a billion dollar company? And I said, unless it's a trick question, I'd much rather own 1% of a billion dollar company. And he said, good, good answer. I can work with you. And he's like, you'd be amazed at how many people, so they'd rather own 100% of a million dollar company. I was like, isn't it just simple math? He goes, no, it's conceptual. He was like, it's, it's really like, you've never heard of a billion dollar company that was owned by, by one person, right? Like it's a, a solopreneur doesn't work. You need to have that teamwork. So the other thing is, you know, just not to wear too many hats, get the right people to help you take into the promised land. Yeah, I love that cap table one. It's almost like the narcissistic personality test, right? You can immediately <laughs> identify like, who would rather be in control than be successful. Uh, it's, I think we all run into that one quite a bit. All right, two, two quick questions. I love asking people these questions because you get insights into them as a person. Um, you've already mentioned a couple good ones, but I'm gonna put you on the spot for one more. So is there a book on your bedside table? Is there something that you're reading that you would recommend? Oh, my bedside table is just the Bible. A book I always go back to is the Celestine Prophecy. I've been loving Ram Dass Be Here Now lately. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place. I'm reading a book called Meet Me in Atlantis. It's helping fuel my desire to go to Antarctica. And, you know, I'm kind of all over the place. But I'd say from the context of this call and being the awesome, the, the, the most awesome ever podcast um, mm -hmm. for founders, I'd say The Lean Startup by Eric Reese is a book every founder should read. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, all right. One other one. Chicago, Land of the Blues, many other things, Smashing Pumpkins, so many bands since then. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm obviously dating myself <laughs> when I say that, but uh, what are you jamming on your playlist? What can you recommend from across the pond? Well, so, you know, I'll, I'll put on like The Cure. I love Girl Talk, who's a mashed up DJ, but a lot of what I'm listening to right now is like the, this mumble rap and some of the, the newer like Migos. I, I like them. I, I like Lil Baby. Um, I, I, I'm really liking a lot of this new, um, new school and then there's a, a, a younger Caucasian artist with blue hair out of New York called Daniel Got Hits most people haven't heard of him yet he hasn't made it but um, Daniel Got Hits is fantastic I found him by searching Gary Vaynerchuk on Spotify the first thing that came up was Gary Vaynerchuk and, and I played it and it was a rap song I'm going, wait, wait a minute now, this guy Daniel Got Hits which is a silly name for, but he, he does songs about famous people names them after him after them so when you search for them you find his songs and uh He's got a song called Haters on there that's become a mantra of mine. And other than that, I love reggae. So you can catch me listening to anything from, you know, Chronics, Kabaka Pyramid, any of the kind of new school, um, you know, bevel rock type of, of Jamaican reggae artists and um, reggae artists really from around the world. I love Maccabee. He does some cool videos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hip hop artist and a reggae artist as well. So I've got some songs that I've written and performed around the world and, um, it, I, I try not to be narcissistic, but I do listen to my own songs probably 10 to 15% of the time. So I'm kind of all over the place. Right 
on. Oh man, you, you had me at had me at Maccabee. Yeah, I think <laughs> Human Rights is one of my favorite reggae songs of all time. Uh, but. Have you have you seen him rapping about vegetables? No, no. no. So <laughs> I'll yeah, look if, that if, up. You, if you just type in Maca B M A C K A space just the letter B for those listening that don't know that, just type him into YouTube. It'll come up with him rapping about like artichoke or asparagus or broccoli and it's just absolutely amazing awesome awesome Corey, Corey warfield so good to reconnect um get to hear a little bit about your story see how far you've come in such a short period of time and um yeah for people that are listening is where where can they find you out in the in the digital world so I think the easiest the easiest way to find me and, and where I point everyone to lately is my new venture, Corey Connects, C-O-R-Y-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S. We've got community, we've got the podcast, we've got business pages, we've got tech that we've launched. It's all around free ways to grow on social media. And that's one that's gamifying LinkedIn as well. We're gamifying recruiting. Um, it's a really cool concept that's in pre-launch right now, but we've got some early buzz. Um, and so if anyone searches Corey Connects, they'll find me anywhere that, that, is, uh, that that's visible. And if it's not visible somewhere, um, please send me a personal message. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a finder's fee and we'll get a Corey Connects in no time. As long as it's a real platform. I, I don't, I, I'm not looking to launch some platforms I've never heard of. But. Right on. Corey, man, always a pleasure, bud. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. And I hope to catch up with you soon. Well, folks, that was Corey Warfield, founder of Shedwool, LinkedIn leadership influencer, and the visionary behind his new venture, Corey Connects. Stay tuned for our next episode, which goes live every other Wednesday. And until then, be sure to check out our website at mostawesomepodcast.com, follow our channel on YouTube, and subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast streaming service. Bis nächstes Mal.